good day to destroy some lives. It's a story of a robbery gone horribly wrong. We had to go and notify four families that their loved ones were tragically murdered on Father's Day. She was a wonderful person. You're just like, no, this isn't happening. It was an unthinkable crime that shed light on a growing national epidemic. How many pills were you taking a day? 20, 25. This is the story of a man triggered. I committed unspeakable acts. And the five minutes that killer wishes he could desperately take back. I realized after that first shot went off that I had just taken the life. Crime files. My name is David Laffer, 118524, Sullivan Correctional Facility. So here's what you need to know about David Laffer. He's a convicted, cold-blooded killer serving five life sentences without the possibility of parole. So, essentially, you'll never breathe a free breath again? That's correct. Laffer recently agreed to sit down with me and speak on camera for the very first time about a wider investigation into gun violence. And during our exclusive interview, he agreed to speak with us about the access that killers like himself have to guns across the tri-state. What type of gun did you use? It was a pistol, a 45 caliber pistol. How did the gun come into your possession? I purchased it. But what I wasn't prepared for was for Laffer to open up in graphic detail about what he did on that Father's Day 12 years ago. That was the day he told me he walked into a neighborhood drugstore with the intent or what he claims was only to steal prescription painkillers. Instead, he ended up executing four innocent victims in broad daylight. Did you look at their faces before you shot them? Two yes, two no. What do you remember about the two faces? There was no look of fear or uh, surprise. I did not walk into the pharmacy intending to hurt anyone. On June 19, 2011, self-admitted drug addict David Laffer thought he had found the perfect place to commit the perfect crime. There was a very small pharmacy, sort of tucked away, nothing really around it. Out of prescription painkillers and desperate, the former U.S. Army soldier says he and his wife, Melinda Brady, drive to a nearby drugstore in the tight-knit blue-collar community of Medford, Long Island. Did your morning start out thinking, I need these pills, I'm going to stage a robbery to get them? Pretty much the day before, I realized that uh, there were no more doctors to go to, no more prescriptions to fill. So at that point, I uh, said, all right. Rob a pharmacy. Drug crazed, and shortly after 10 o'clock in the morning that Father's Day, a very nervous laugher walks into the pharmacy wearing a fake beard, sunglasses, a white baseball cap, trying to conceal his identity. He's armed with a 45 millimeter handgun and says his only intent was to rob the pharmacy. Were you able to get the pills? Yes, I walked out with quite a substantial amount of pills. Laffer walks out of Haven's Drugs that morning, having stolen more than 11,000 hydrocodone pills, also known as Vicodin. But he also stole something else that day. Full lives. It was a vicious crime that has rocked the Medford community. Two employees and two customers were shot dead in cold blood, and now Laffer and his wife, Melinda Brady, were on the lam. Nobody knew why it happened right away and people were fearful of even leaving their homes. I'm scared now, and I, just, and I just can't believe anybody would hurt somebody in that way. Grief-stricken neighbors said the pharmacy owner had been serving the Medford community for decades. He collapsed at the scene upon learning of the bloodbath that occurred inside his drugstore. Just a stiff shot. He was the type of guy, if you need the medicine, he'd give it to you. He always said, drugs and money's not worth someone's life. Take it. It's yours. Three of them didn't even know what was coming. Decided was about to get married. She was actually planning her wedding. She was a wonderful person. <laughs> so wonderful. Sheffield, who was a father and grandfather, Ferguson was covering for another pharmacist at the time. And Jennifer Mejia was a 17-year-old high school student who was getting ready for her prom. She had her prom date. She had the color of her dress, the color of her shoes, everything she had it picked out. 
gunned down just five days before her high school graduation. Jennifer Mejia wasn't even supposed to work at the drugstore that morning. Her sister Leslie tells me that she picked up a shift at the drugstore for extra spending money for her prom. What do you remember most about her? She was ready to graduate. She was ready to start the, a new chapter in her life, you know? She was excited for it. Do you know what she wanted to be when she grew up? She wanted to be a doctor. Yeah, she wanted to be a doctor and she wanted me to be a nurse. She had a plan for both of you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leslie told me that she remembers her cousin calling her that morning to tell her police were in front of the drugstore. She says she knew at that very moment something was terribly wrong. And I hung up on him very quickly and then I called my parents. Can you go check on Jennifer? I said, Dad, please go check. I, don't, I have a really bad feeling, like, and I started crying. Like, I, it's like my heart knew, you know? Leslie says waiting for a word about her sister was excruciating. I called her like 50 times. I called the pharmacy and nobody was answering. And my parents got home and I was just like, what took you guys so long? Like, and they sat me in, on the couch and my mom grabbed my hands and she, she was like, you need to be strong. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, um, they killed your sister. That could have been any one of our family members uh, going to pick up a prescription for you, whether for them or another family member. Totally four innocent victims that were just uh, cut down. He never announced the robbery. He never made his intentions, other than an intention to murder anybody, clear. And there was no indication that there was any resistance from the victims either, right? Absolutely not. I know that he sent her to the back and she was able to hear when something happened to the pharmacist. So she knew something was, was coming, you know, that, that something was going to happen to her. What do you think was going through your sister's mind in that moment? Where she was, there was no way out. I can only imagine how scared she was in that moment. She was little. She was 17. She was young and she was just four feet tall, 11 inches tall. She wasn't going to hurt anybody. And he could have just taken what he needed and left. By the end of Father's Day, police were generating hundreds of tips. And one name kept coming up, David Lamper. He was suddenly public enemy number one. He had received the most amount of tips. We knew that people were saying he had a drug problem. They also quickly knew that Lamper was their man because of the actual physical evidence he left at the crime scene. He had touched several spots in the area, as well as a piece of paper that fell down. And that piece of paper ended up being very important with identifying who the assailant was. As we looked into him, we saw that he had a 45 caliber handgun that was registered to him. Ultimately, that was the caliber handgun that was used during this, these murders. The murders happened on a Sunday, and by Wednesday, police were ready to make their move. They had been staking at his home just about two miles from the murder scene. The arrest made by undercover detectives and SWAT teams. They got him. Do you remember the moment when you were told that David Laffer was arrested? I remember watching it on TV with my parents. I was just like, this is so close to our house. Like, it's literally like five minutes away. One of the most intense moments came just minutes after Laffer's arrest. The grandmother of one of the victims raced to his home with a message for the man who had killed her granddaughter, 33-year-old Jamie Tassena. You're the devil, and God always wins out. Your day will come. When we return... David Laffer is taken into custody. I remember David totally saying he was not involved in anything like this. And detectives say during questioning, he uses one of the oldest excuses in the books. Plus... You said you weren't the evil monster that ended four lives. What are you? How would you describe what you did? What crime files? Hey, manhunt. Police make their move. Laffer and his wife were arrested and taken into custody. Police officially charged Laffer with murder and resisting arrest Wednesday night. They say he gunned down all four people inside of Haven Drugs on Father's Day in order to steal prescription painkillers. This department has been working tirelessly around the clock to take this killer off the street. And within 72 hours, we arrested him. But Laffer and his wife didn't go down easily. According to the arrest report, both fought back. Laffer held onto an officer's gun, while Brady grabbed onto an officer's leg as they were trying to put her husband into handcuffs. 
Laffer's wife, seen here in this yellow shirt, was also arrested at the couple's home. 29-year-old Melinda Brady is charged with robbery for what police say was her involvement in the crime. As fast as they were arrested, Melinda Brady was just as quick to throw her husband under the bus, singing like a canary to the reporters at her perp walk. He did it. He did all this. This is the first time you ever took a gun, committed a crime. Correct. Did you think you were going to get away with it? No. No. If you knew that you were going to get caught, mm -hmm. why kill the other three? It didn't really matter. The withdrawal was all-encompassing. It outweighed everything. Anything. Addiction is not a good thing. So here's the thing about David Laffer. He told me, like a lot of people, he turned to Vicodin to curb the pain after multiple sports and dental injuries, and before he knew it, he was hooked. So at the height of your addiction, how many pills were you taking a day? 20? 25. Describe the need to take those pills. It's really just an all-encompassing... need to kill the pain, physical pain, and then it turns into a battle. It's just, you know, the classic addiction. So it was an all-encompassing, 24-7 type of addiction? Right, especially for that last year, yeah. And despite having an arsenal of guns, David Laffer certainly didn't fit the profile of a cold-blooded killer either. He had no priors, so no, did he, he didn't even come across as a potential criminal, frankly. He'd never been arrested for anything before. And that made it more difficult for law enforcement to try and comprehend everything that had happened. Laffer came from a good home, a good family. He had no criminal history. Tell me about your childhood. Great childhood. Um, parents weren't uh, abusers, weren't drug addicts, weren't alcoholics. Very typical suburban up Brandon, nothing unusual. After graduating high school, Laffer enlisted in the Army Reserves, and he even went to intelligence school. You wanted to work for the CIA? That was my uh, one of my goals. Laffer says all of his goals were dashed after he became addicted to painkillers in 2010. What did the worst of your addiction look like? Well, when I was arrested, I'm six feet tall and I was arrested at 122 pounds. So that's probably the worst. At the time of his arrest, Laffer said little about his drug use. In fact, police say he denied having anything to do with the murders, using one of the oldest excuses in the books, something to the tune of, my dog ate my homework. I said, how, how do you explain that your gun that is registered to you is uh, matched as the murder weapon? And without hesitation, David said to me that he was cleaning his gun about a week or so prior, took the gun apart, and it took the barrel out, and his dog came up, took the barrel away, a piece of the, the gun, the barrel, and ran away with it. And maybe someone found that barrel, used that barrel, and used it in one of their guns, and that's why it could have possibly have come back to him. I said, David... If you would have come and told me that, that you have a drug problem and Melinda has a, a drug problem and you had to do this in order to make yourselves feel better because you're going through withdrawals or any other story like that, I said, maybe someone would have been able to connect with you. But when you tell us a story like this, it just shows you the evil person that you are. You didn't believe him for a second. No, not at all. Do you still think he is an evil person? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, he's never showed any remorse for this. He'll die in jail. You said you weren't the evil monster that ended four lives. What are you? How would you describe what you did? How would I describe what I did? My actual actions? Selfish and greedy. And how did you feel when you pulled the trigger? Surprised. Shocked. Uh, unexpected, mentally just a, a switch, just sort of triggered. I realized after that uh, first shot went off that my life has now entirely changed, so, yeah, altered. 
unknown murder suspect David Laffer looked gaunt and disheveled as he left his overnight lockup. Detectives walked him out of the 5th Precinct in handcuffs and shackles on the way to his arraignment. In court, Chief Prosecutor John Collins called the Father's Day murder of four the worst he had ever seen. This is, as I said, the most cold-blooded robbery homicide that I have seen in this county. They often describe this as one of the most gruesome crime scenes in the history of Long Island. When you hear that, what does that mean to you? It's almost like they're speaking about someone else or something else. Is he an evil person? His, his actions were certainly evil, yes. As evil as anything I've seen in 30 years. Why do you think he pleaded guilty? One was the evidence we had against them. We did have a very good case, but of course you see defendants oftentimes try cases despite the mountain of evidence against them. But he also expressed that he didn't want to put his own family and the victim's families through a trial. Still ahead. What would you like to say to your victim's families right now? What would you like to say to your victim's families right now? Oh, wow. There's a lot. I pray for my victim's families every night. The families of Raymond, Jennifer, Byron, Jamie, every night. I still remember all of the victims' impact statements during my sentencing when the families got up and started uh, to give a little background on each of the victims. One of those victims, a young teenage girl who wanted to be Jennifer. a doctor. Mm -hmm. The pharmacist assistant. Do you think about where she would be today? Oh, sure. Absolutely. How would you describe your remorse? Do you feel remorse? Eternal, absolutely. I wish there was a stronger word than remorse, but uh, think about it every day. Every day. Have you forgiven yourself for no. what's happened? No. And throughout this interview, um, you've been very stoic. That is true. Because it's an interview. It's time to be stoic. I think it's a time to be real. Hmm. Possibly, but it's not who I am. Do you have private moments where you get more emotional and still cry over, you know, what happened? On occasion, sure. I'm spending the rest of my life defending myself from two minutes of my life. It would just be nice if people would look at the other 33 years rather than the two, three minutes dead. I committed unspeakable acts. No matter how bad he feels, it's not going to bring him back. Have you forgiven David Lapper? In my own way, I've forgiven him. Um, in the sense that what lets me go on with my life and not be in the moment as far as having hate towards him or having any ill feelings towards him. You don't have any hate towards him? No. I, I can say that I don't hate him. I hope that he knows what he did is wrong, and I hope that he realizes what he took from people, and that he, in his mind, he, he thought it was okay to decide when their lives were gonna end, and he had no right. He killed a piece of us when he did that, and he took a piece from us that we can't get back no matter what he says. So, I don't wish him bad, but I don't wish great things for him either. basically just a straight up robbery of, of the pills. We knew that that we had a bigger problem coming down the line. that day. He didn't. And it just goes to show you what that addiction will make people do. 